Why is vitamin C so important to your body? Maybe you've heard of it being this powerful antioxidant that could potentially help fight off these harmful substances called free radicals that can damage your cells, DNA, and other structures throughout your body. Maybe you've even heard of vitamin C being associated with that disease of pirates and other sailors from way back in the day called scurvy. So we'll definitely have to talk about how Captain Jack Sparrow avoided scurvy back in the day. And that'll even bring up a really cool topic about how vitamin C is essential for building one of the most abundant and therefore arguably one of the most important proteins in your body. And of course, we've got to talk about vitamin C and its association with the immune system. Can it help prevent the common cold? Can it help you get over the cold faster? You've got a few questions to answer, so let's jump right into this. Vitamins are essential nutrients in order for our bodies to function properly. And obviously, vitamin C falls into this category. Vitamin C is also known by another name called ascorbic acid, but I'll refer to it as vitamin C throughout this video. Now, most of us will get vitamin C through actually ingesting it. You can get it intravenously through, say, like an IV bag, but again, most of us are gonna be putting it in our mouth in the form of, say, like an orange, a grapefruit, or other citrus fruits, even certain leafy greens like cabbage, broccoli, even peppers and tomatoes have vitamin C. And of course, we can always get vitamin C through supplementation. Now, whatever we put into our mouth, whatever fruit, vegetable, or supplement it is, it'll eventually make it down into the stomach that you can see here on the tray. And here's the small intestine down here, kind of coiled up in the center, and even the large intestine coming around there just to orient you. But that vitamin C will actually pass through the stomach and start moving through the small intestine and it gets absorbed in what we refer to as the distal small intestine. Distal just kind of refers to like distance or further from the point of origin. And so it's gonna be absorbed kind of towards the end of the small intestine. And when we say absorbed, that means we've pulled it into the bloodstream. And when we're talking about absorbing vitamins into the body and into the bloodstream, it's important to have this discussion about fat soluble vitamins versus water soluble vitamins. Vitamin C being one of those water soluble vitamins. Now these water soluble vitamins are quickly absorbed into the body and can be transported freely throughout the fluid environment of the body, like the bloodstream, hence water soluble. Whereas if we compare that to fat soluble, kind of think of that analogy or of the oil and the water, they don't really like each other. And so those fat soluble vitamins don't move as freely throughout the fluid environment of the body and actually require a carrier or a transporter to move them throughout the bloodstream and to the target tissues. But once those fat soluble vitamins have reached their target tissues and can perform their functions, if there's any excess of the fat soluble vitamins or extra, that extra or excess can be stored in the liver or, and or in the adipose tissue. And so think about that from this perspective. If I went extended periods of time without ingesting a fat soluble vitamin, I could pull any of that or extra from those storage places like the liver and the adipose. Now that's kind of a pro of the fat soluble vitamins. You can kind of think of a con as well. That means I could also store too much in there. And so you are actually more likely to get toxic or hit toxicity levels sooner with ingesting too much of the fat soluble vitamins as compared to say like the water soluble vitamins. Because the water soluble vitamins, once they reach their target tissues and perform their functions, if there's any extra, those water soluble vitamins like vitamin C will not be stored in the liver or the adipose. Instead, they'll move back into the bloodstream, eventually make it to the kidneys through this artery called the renal artery here. And this renal artery will branch into smaller arteries that will eventually make it to the outside of the kidney called the renal cortex. And the tiny little arterioles or little blood vessels that you can't see underneath the probe will then have that vitamin C and it will move from the blood vessels into tiny little urinary tubules. And those urinary tubules will funnel into larger tubes that you can see getting bigger and bigger and eventually out the ureter and outside the body. So from a perspective of pros and cons, the water soluble vitamins are therefore more important to ingest on a day to day basis, but you're much less likely to get toxic or hit toxicity levels on the water soluble vitamins because they won't get stored in these tissues and instead will get excreted in the urine. Finally, let's get to the nitty gritty of vitamin C. Yes, we know how it's consumed, how it can move throughout the body and even how it's excreted, but what does it actually do inside of you? Well, one of the amazing functions of vitamin C is that it's known as a powerful antioxidant. But what does that word even mean, antioxidant? Well, antioxidants are amazing substances that can help combat or neutralize potentially harmful compounds called free radicals or reactive oxygen species. Now, we'll talk about exactly how vitamin C combats a free radical, but 
how do we even get free radicals inside of our bodies? Well, you just breathing and utilizing oxygen creates free radicals. So when our cells utilize oxygen to create the energy source of our cells called ATP or adenosine triphosphate, the majority of that oxygen that's utilized is actually reduced to water. So essentially harmless. But about four to five percent of that oxygen is not and becomes these free radicals or reactive oxygen species. And these are damaging to components of our cells. It's known to create what's called oxidative stress or oxidative damage. And so you're starting to see this connection to antioxidant. And this is where the chemistry people get really excited and really involved because reactive oxygen species or free radicals are unstable compounds. And when you get into chemistry, when we talk about stable compounds, in general, stable compounds have a proper number or proper pairing of electrons, and free radicals do not. And you can think of them as yearning to steal and gain an electron because they're so reactive. And what happens is, is think of this on your cell. Maybe a free radical comes in contact with your cell membrane and tries to take an electron from a phospholipid of your cell membrane, or maybe a protein in the cell, or maybe even the DNA. And when it tries to steal that electron, it damages that component of the cell and can even create a chain reaction of damaging other components. And what these antioxidants do is that they can donate an electron to that free radical to neutralize and stabilize it so it won't go on and damage structures or components of your cells. And that's what vitamin C can do. It's pretty amazing and awesome to think about. Vitamin C can also help with vitamin E. Vitamin E is a antioxidant, but when vitamin E donates its electron to try to neutralize a free radical, it kind of gets all wonky, because wonky is a technical term, and unstable. And vitamin C is like, I got you, vitamin E. Donates its electron, stabilizes vitamin E, and then vitamin E can go on its merry little way. Now, another amazing function of vitamin C is that it is essential in activating an enzyme that is important in producing this protein called collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the human body. And so without vitamin C, you'll have weak and defective collagen. And collagen is known as this protein that provides amazing tensile strength. It's kind of this microscopic string-like protein. Think of it as a, like a microscopic rope. If you tried to pull it apart, it would resist being pulled apart, thereby again creating tensile strength for the tissues that you find it in. And again, I said it's the most abundant. You find collagen in so many places. You find it in tendons ligaments, cartilage, your skin, blood vessels, and even in your bones. And we could make that list even longer. The point is you can find it in so many different places, but this is this link between vitamin C and the disease scurvy because the symptoms of scurvy come from this weak and defective collagen. So for example, people with scurvy will have poor wound healing. When we get a cut, normally the cells come in and they deposit new collagen and you heal up. But if you have weak and defective collagen, then the wounds aren't going to heal very well. People with scurvy will also have easy bruising, because remember, those blood vessels would also have collagen in the wall. If you have weak, defective collagen, those tiny little blood vessels will rupture, equals easy bruising. And yes, of course, the collagen in the connective tissues and the structures of the mouth. Teeth can fall out, causing poor dentition. And yes, people with scurvy can also have poor bone health. And it's interesting to think about because what we've learned about vitamin C is that we know that we can't store it. So say you go on this long voyage back in the day and you, you know, eat up all the fruits and vegetables at the beginning of the voyage and then over the next month or two you don't have any vitamin C, you can develop those symptoms of scurvy. And in a way it's a pretty easy fix, it's just we didn't know what was going on. But some of these earlier explorers, one named Captain James Cook, he was a British explorer, started to figure out that if his crew was eating certain fresh vegetables and other foods, they weren't developing scurvy. He obviously didn't know the exact mechanism of, was it vitamin C, what was in those vegetables or those foods that were preventing scurvy, but he noticed that correlation there. And so, when we're talking about pirates like Captain Jack Sparrow and the other pirates of the Pirates of the Caribbean, it would be wise when they're pirating and pillaging, they would also pirate and pillage for things like fruits and vegetables to stop them from getting scurvy. And that would definitely help with a lot of those symptoms and prevent scurvy. It's not the only thing that would, you know, prevent poor dentition because some of those pirates would still have poor dentition. So, you know, pirate and pillage for a toothbrush next time too. And finally, the age old question, can vitamin C help reduce your risk of say catching the common cold? And even if you do catch it, can it help reduce the time that you have it and even the severity of the symptoms? 
But we do know that vitamin C levels do decrease in the plasma and in the white blood cells during an infection or an illness. So you might think, well, if I helped boost that up through supplementation, would that help? Well, the most commonly quoted study is a study that is a meta-analysis that actually looked at 30 other studies from 1966 to 2012. And what this did is it looked at all these different studies around vitamin C and looked at people who are supplementing 200 milligrams or more. And what they found is that those that were supplementing 200 milligrams or more did not actually have a reduction in the risk of actually catching the cold. However, they did show a potential for a reduction in the time that they had the cold by about 8% and even a reduction in the severity of those cold symptoms. And again, this wasn't just you hurry and reach for the vitamin C out of nowhere when you got sick. This was through consistent supplementa supplementation on a day-to-day -day basis. And so for the general population, supplementing over 200 milligrams of vitamin C, is it gonna reduce your chances? Not so much, but could it help maybe reduce the time and the severity? Yeah, it's possible. But there was one subset of people or a group of people that did show a reduction in the actual risk of catching the cold and that was people who were participating in strenuous physical activity or kind of in strenuous circumstances things like marathon runners skiers they even included uh, soldiers that were working in arctic conditions those groups were found to have a little bit of a reduction in actually the risk of catching a cold through consistent supplementation now is vitamin c the end all be all for your immune system no, your immune system is going to try to fight whatever it can, but again, a potential help for consistent supplementation. As always, thank you for watching our crazy anatomy and physiology videos. We really hope that you guys get something out of them and learn something new about this amazing human body that we all get to walk around with every single day. If you feel the need, like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and comment like crazy. We really do appreciate your guys' feedback, and Jeffrey and I will see you in the next video.